I'd invite uh, those of you who are here to take your Bibles and turn to Galatians 4. Galatians 4. Um, as, we, as we said uh, in our announcements, we're, we're coming up on, on uh, Passion Week. So next week, Lord willing, is Palm Sunday, followed up by Easter. Um, and then in our own culture, what spring break and masters bring. So it's it's a, we'll take a break the next two weeks from our, our series in Galatians and pick it back up after Easter. Um, so this will be our, our last series and you know, last sermon in Galatians until um, after Easter. Hear now God's word from Galatians 4, uh, verses 1 through 10. Hear now God's word. I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave though he is the owner of everything, but he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not God's. But now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world, whose slaves you want to be once more? You observe days and months and seasons and years. I'm afraid I may have labored over you in vain. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let, let's pray together. Um, Father, this is a, um, a sneaky big text, as they say. Um, one of five that talks about adoption. And Lord, we don't give that doctrine its proper due. But this morning you have us here in your good providence, in your wonderful care. You as our heavenly father have us parked here this morning. So Lord, we would ask that you would uh, set our hearts upon this word this morning. That you give us ears to hear, minds to listen, hearts to embrace this good news. And we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Elton John, a British born singer, was the first actually um, First one to enter the U.S. album charts at number one. He's won a Brit Award for Outstanding Achievement three times. I think he's a knight now. I think he's Sir Elton John. He owns six gold, 38 platinum, and one diamond album. So, so as far as musical career goes, to say he's had an outstanding and accomplished one would be quite the understatement. None of this, however, impressed his father. Stanley Dwight, a flight lieutenant in the Royal Air Force, never attended one of Elton's shows. He never expressed pride in his son's success, and consequently, their relationship was strained until his death from heart disease in 1991. A few years ago, um, Elton, Elton John wrote his new autobiography. It's entitled Me, which, of course... Why not for an autobiography? And he admits in it he spent his whole career trying to show my father what I'm made of. It's crazy, he said. I just, want it, I just wanted his approval. I'm still trying to prove to him that what I do is fine. And he's been dead for almost 30 years. I wonder if you, how many of you have had that experience with your dad or you know somebody who's had that experience with your dad. And I hope that's not an experience with your, with your earthly father. But my guess is that more often than not, that's our experience with our heavenly father. I bet most of us resonate with Elton John when we think of our heavenly father. Does he really like me? Do I have his approval? Do I need to do more? You wouldn't be alone in that mindset. The Galatians here that Paul is writing to had that mindset. 
And Paul says here in Galatians 4, you can live one or two ways. You got one or two ways to live. You can live as slaves or you can live as sons. It's up to you. We can be, as this text says, imprisoned as slaves or as enjoyed as sons. First of all, Paul says you can be imprisoned as slaves in verses 1 through 3 and 8 through 11. And we talked about this a little bit. Like Paul says here in this illustration that an heir in verse 1, as long as he's a child, is no different from a slave, though he's the owner of everything. Though, as it says explicitly in the Greek, that he is Lord of all the things, as a child, he is no different than a slave. In, in the ancient Near Eastern economy, the household, the small business, the child did not have access to decision-making ability about the family business. He didn't have access to the family resources. He didn't have family, he didn't have access to the family inheritance. And we, we, until he was an adult, until the time he was appointed by his father. And we understand that. We would never execute the estate and find out that a six-year-old got $1.5 million. We would never hand that over to them right away. Hey, I wonder how many shamrock shakes at McDonald's $1.5 million can buy. No, we put that in a trust and say, hey, when you get older, when you get more mature, when your brain develops so you can make some wise decisions, you'll get access to that. Paul uses a child illustration to show how we're imprisoned as slaves under the law. Under the law, the Old Testament law, we're just like this child. We need a guardian. We need a manager. We need a, an, an, an economides, a steward. We need a pedagogue. We need someone to keep us out of trouble and help us put our best foot forward. Paul says that just like, there's not just the illustration that when you're a child, you're just like slaves, but there's also a current problem. There's a current problem of enslavement, and Paul throughout the book of Galatians keeps bringing up this point. I don't know if you've been catching it throughout the previous weeks that in Galatians 1, It says, grace to you and peace from God our Father who gave himself for our sins. Why? To deliver us. That's that's freedom language. To deliver us from the present evil age. Galatians 2, 4 through 5. These false brothers, these agitators are brought in. Why? To spy out our freedom that they might bring us again into slavery. Galatians 3. The scriptures imprisoned everything under sin. In 322, in 323, now before faith came, before Christ came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith. It's throughout the whole first three chapters. Paul is saying that if you bring yourself under the law, if you try to use the law as a means of approval and winning with God, you are imprisoning yourself in slavery. There's the problem of enslavement, that we are just not slaves as it were under under the law but but we are slaves under sin that because the curse has come the whole earth is enslaved to the curse because adam and eve fell we are enslaved to the sin that without christ we are under the power of sin we have no choice but to sin that's the only thing we can do it's in our nature before christ Paul uses this word, elementary principles of the world, in verse 3. He says, in the same way also, just like this child is just like the slave, when we were children, we were enslaved to the elementary principles of this world. This is, a, this is an odd saying. It's the word stoichia, and in, in, in the Greek mind, there were four elementary principles, earth, wind, fire, and water. And when this term, this phrase is used, it's not used in a positive way. It's used in a negative way here in Galatians. The, as you're enslaved to the elementary principles. Paul will use it in a negative way to the Colossians. He says, beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world. In Hebrews 5, the writer to the Hebrews is chiding his readers. He says, you, are, you need milk and not meat. You are under the first principles. This elementary principles of the world is, is just what it sounds like. It's the ABCs. It's the one, two, threes. 
It's what we're born with. Paul says that if you go back into slavery, you're bringing yourself back into the building blocks, the hard wiring of the world and of sin. Our problem is an enslavement. Our problem is in elementary principles to the world, but, but there's a problem of a, of a turning back. Paul says in verse 11, I'm afraid that you've, I've labored in vain. In verse 9, but now that you've come to know God, or rather, more importantly, to be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world? There it is again in a negative context. Whose slaves you want to be. Why are you going back to that, Paul says? You, you've tasted and seen the gospel. And the, the, the Jewish, especially the Jewish Galatian readers would pick up on Exodus language. The people of God were enslaved in Egypt for 400 years and they're on their way out. And in Numbers 14, it says, that night all the members of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron and the whole assembly said to them, if only we had died in Egypt or in this wilderness, why is the Lord bringing us to this land to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be taken plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? In Exodus 17, Exodus 17, all right? It's, it's not far away. You guys have just seen the pillar of, uh, and the, the, the cloudy pillar, the fiery pillar. You've just seen the entire Egyptian army swallowed through the Red Sea after you walked through on dry ground. But what do we find in Exodus 17? And the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said unto them, Would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots, and when we did eat bread to the full, for you have brought us into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger." Do you see why it's called the elementary principles of the world, the basic, the ABCs? Because you don't have to learn it. You come that way hardwired. It's the same way that Adam and Eve worked. It's the same way that the children of Israel worked. And it's the same way that we work. We have doubted the goodness of the Father for us. And if we doubt the Father's goodness given in the free, gracious, complete work of Jesus Christ, we'll go back to do it on our own. We just, remember, we just want a little Jesus plus. Just, just a little plus. Just a little plus that gives me control. Just a little plus that wins me, wins me approval. Notice he says in verse nine, they are weak and worthless. They cannot do anything. My friend, God is not a cosmic vending machine where we put in our coins of righteousness or scan our debit card of good works and out pops a nice little treat. It's not how that works. In verse nine there, we can work for it. It's like, it's like trying to steal a pack of ramen noodles and running from the cops while all the while Thanksgiving feast is at home on the kitchen table prepared for you by somebody else. My friends, that's enslavement. And sometimes we, the voice is loud in our ears. You, you didn't do good enough. You sinned that sin again. What are you thinking? Don't you dare go back and, and, and confess that sin to God. You've, you've, run out of, you've run out of forgiveness. He's not forgiving of you again. You know, you know the voices in your head? Uh, at least I'm better than that guy. God, you gotta like me because I'm better than that guy. I haven't tarnished your name or done a gross public sin. God, at least I'm better than that guy. God, you owe me. You owe me on this promotion. I've done my devotions. I've had my prayer. I've gone to a church. I, I've gone to a church plant. I mean, that's, that's double bonus, right? We know how it goes. We know how it goes. My friends, that is reversion to enslavement that is buying into weak and worthless enslavering principles of this world and Paul says you don't need to have any of it you're not slaves 
We can be imprisoned as slaves or we can be enjoyed as sons. Um, I've watched my fair share of Sylvester Stallone movies, the Rocky franchises, the Rambos, Cobra. He's got a newer one I stumbled on recently called Prison Break. And um, Sylvester Stallone's character is part of a private security firm. And he and, and the executive committee are, their job is to contract with the government and to covertly become a prisoner in these maximum security facilities. And the reason they want to get in these maximum security facilities is to see where the weak points are. Where can we escape? Where is high security? Where is low security? Where are you vulnerable? And in one of his uh, escapades, he gets himself into a fight, gets thrown into solitary confinement, but he finds a way out. He takes the, um, the, the milk carton, the little milk carton of chocolate milk that they give him, and he somehow gets off the plastic, the little film of plastic that's off the wrapper, and, and they put, whoever built the prison put the key code to his cell within arm's reach. So he, he somehow puts the, the plastic on the, on the key code. And after a few days of the, of the guards punching the code, he gets it back off and he hides it in his Bible. And then it's just a matter of time for him to figure out these code. And what do you know? Reaches around, codes out, messes with the cameras, and he's walking on the streets. Pretty ingenious. He, he cracked the code on how to get out of that prison with a little plastic from the milk cart. How are we gonna crack the code and get out of our enslavement, our reversion to Egypt, our addiction to the elementary principles that bind us? I wanna quote uh, one of my favorite dead theologians, J.I. Packer. If you want to judge how well a person understands Christianity, find out how much he makes of the thought of being God's child and having God as his father. If this is not the thought that prompts and controls his worship and his prayers and his whole outlook on life, it means that he does not understand Christianity very well at all. My friends, the most important operating principle that we can, as Martin Luther said, beat into our heads is that God is our loving Father and nothing we can do will change that. Paul explains this here in verse four through seven, but when the fullness of time has come, God sent for the son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those that were under the law, that we might receive adoption as sons. There's a, there's a time aspect here. We've already talked about the Exodus and not just the children of Israel that, that went to, but the reason we, we had Hosea read this morning. Hosea knew it is in, in, in the prophecy God says, and the writer says of, of Jesus, out of Egypt, if I've called my son, Jesus not only went literally down into the country of Egypt, but he went down into our own slavery. He recapitulated the Exodus for us. That's what he talked about on the hill, on the mountain of his transfiguration, that he must go complete his Exodus. There's a time aspect here. You notice it here. Look in verse, just, just a summary here. In verse one, as long as... Um, he's under, under guardians and managers, verse 2, until the date. Uh, when, in verse 3. Verse 4, when the fullness of time has come. Again, God is working out the adoption of his sons throughout time. He is powerfully working the calendar for our good. There's a Trinitarian aspect here. Look in verse 4. God, the Father, sends God the Son. Verse 6, and because you are sons, God sends, who else? God, the spirit of his son into our hearts. Do you see the Trinitarian working here? God the Father is involved. God the Son is involved. God the Spirit is involved. It's a Trinitarian adventure here. There is an divine, why? Because there is a divine enjoyment of one another from all eternity past. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit enjoying sweet communion with one another. And they decide to create man. Why? Because they're lonely? No, they decide to create man to bring him into communion with them. 
And so God does that in the, in the course of space and time and adopts us as sons. And he does so up close. God sends forth his son. This is a Trinitarian working. And again, I'm going to quote St. Patrick in his confessions. Since I believe in the Trinity, I must make known the gift of God and his eternal peace without fear of danger. My friends, this eternal God sends forth his son, the son, the God sends forth his spirit, and the spirit, we are sent forth with that spirit. There's time, there's trinity, there's a task here. Jesus says he's born of a woman. Born of a woman, aren't we all? Aren't we all? And again, those familiar with the Old Testament would immediately, a, 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 an alarm would go off, a, a bell would go off, and at Adam and Eve's curse, God is cursing the ground. He's cursing the serpent. He's cursing Eve. He's cursing Adam. And in the midst of this curse after curse after curse, God breaks forth in Genesis 3.15 with this first gospel. I will put enmity between you, Satan, and the woman, between your seed and her seed. You'll bruise, you'll nip at the heel, but he'll crush your head. He'll crush your head. And Eve took him up on that promise. You know why we know that? Because in, in Genesis 4, at the birth of her first son, she says, I have gotten a man child, the Lord. She thought her firstborn son was that promised son. But no, we've got to wait all the way, all these years until Jesus Christ is born of a woman. This is the promised son who would crush the serpent's head. But he's not just born of a woman. He's born under the law. My friends, Jesus didn't come and, and get the fast pass and go to the front of the line. He didn't get a get out of jail free card. He didn't say, hey guys, uh, uh, I'll be right back. Let me take care of this. No, he entered into all our temptation. He was, as the writer to the Hebrews said, in all points, tempted like as we are yet without sin. Whereas Adam and Eve were deceived by the tempter with the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, Jesus went into the wilderness and he took Satan's direct best shot to succumb to the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. And Jesus said, no, no, I'll take my father's approval. And then after his temptation, he would go to his baptism and we hear the father's voice. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And what do you think the father's saying about you today? If you are in Christ, he's saying the exact same thing about you. You are my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. See, in order to redeem, Jesus had to be born of a woman, born under the law. And look at that in verse 4. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. Verse 5 to do what? We have two that, that's, to, to redeem those who are under law, that's, that's freedom language, that's, that's restoring language, but also that we might receive the adoption of sons. Jesus was sent to be born of a woman, to be born of the law, to take the law on him, not just that he might redeem us, but that with the end, the goal, the telos, the purpose that we might receive adoption of sons. David Garner, one of my colleagues, says the significance of adoption in Galatians 4 or 5 could hardly be overstated. The grammatical structure here, two purpose clauses that culminate with adoption of sons, make adoption the very goal of Christ's coming. Jesus' divine mission was to make us sons of God so that we receive the approval of the Father my friends, this is so important. This is so important that we get this. That it's not just an afterthought or something we go through, but it's dug down deep in us. It's reflexive. That it's, an op it, it's a rewired operating system. That we don't operate out of the old system that we showed up with. Is God going to be good to me? Does God like me? And instead, we operate out of we are sons and daughters of the living God 
by virtue of our union with Christ, by virtue of the word of the Father. What do you think God thinks of you? Here's a couple diagnostic tests. What do you think God thinks of you when you're at your worst? And if I can quote a preacher that I heard a couple weeks ago, we need a God who just doesn't like us at our best. We need a God who embraces us at our worst. What do you think God thinks of you? Do you think he's gonna send you to your room, ground you? Or do you think he's gonna embrace you and invite you up to the table? How does your prayer life did, did you see that in verse six? And because your sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. You see how important that is? Who's the only person in scripture out of whose lips those words come? It's Jesus Christ in Mark 14. Abba, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. We get to take the very intimate, childlike cries upon our lips and say, Abba, Father. Some of you need to take some risks because you know you got nothing to lose. Some of us as parents, I'll start with me first. We need to operate on this principle that our parenting first, again, I'm, I'm the worst at this. Our parenting needs to first be grounded around the fact that God has made us his sons and daughters. And we are enjoyed as sons because we get this inheritance. Verse seven, so you're no longer a slave but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. What do you think you're getting? You think you're gonna send yourself out of the will? You can't do that. If you're in union with Jesus Christ, you are kept. Why? Because you have the Spirit in you. The third person of the Trinity resides with you and witnesses, eyewitnesses, that we are sons and daughters of the living God. You want to go back to Jesus plus, Paul says? Mm -mm. That's weak and worthless. You know what the antidote is for being skeptical of the Father? It's adoption as sons. It's adoption as sons. Um, when I was dating my, um, my now wife, Abby, uh, she, I, I had to, uh, the, the people that she ran me through, like, check this guy out, check this guy out, check this guy out. Her dad, her college pastor, her boss, her older brother, her younger brother, she had a set of friends, too. They're good friends. We're friends to this day. And uh, it was the time when Downton Abbey was coming on PBS every, every Sunday evening. And she had a crew that she'd watch that with. And so, me being the um, motivated suitor that I was, forced myself to be interested in Downton Abbey so that I could be wed to Abby. You see what it is there? I'm sorry, honey. And I wanted to be with her watching Downton Abbey, and she, again, was running me through, you know, the approval committee. And I'm grateful it worked out. And I generally did come to enjoy the series Downton Abbey. We saw it all the way through. We went and saw the movie. And uh, again, it's a, it's a, it's it, when it's on PBS, it's not not an action film, guys. Uh, it's it's a, surrounding this this royal family in in England around World War One. And um, a, a minister, David Zoll, writes uh, about this particular scene in his blog on Mar his website, Mockingbird. His name's David Zoll, and he writes this. Um, there's, a, there's a character named Daisy. Daisy's a, a handmaid. She's on the, sort of the bottom of the social standing in the kitchen. 
This is, was a little lengthy, so bear with me. Ever since Downton began, we've been rooting for Daisy. The, the clumsy, simple-minded servant girl and William Mason, the footman, who clearly held a candle for her. At first, Daisy doesn't give him the time of day, but ever so slowly, his sweet demeanor wears her down and she warms toward him, not to the point where she reciprocates, but certainly the point where she no longer is avoiding his bright advances. When William enlists in the British Army because of World War I and asks Daisy to marry him, she can't bring herself to say no. The last thing she wants for him is to go to the front of a war with a broken heart. So with a conflicted conscience, she consents to the engagement and the writing is on the wall. William suffers a fatal injury. He's brought back to Downton and the house rallies to fulfill his dying wish. He and Daisy are married a few hours before he succumbs to his wounds. Daisy is again deeply reluctant about the whole thing, but cannot, succumb, cannot summon the callousness to assert herself. In the wake of William's death, so her husband, for a few hours, he's her husband, he dies. In the wake of his death, his father, the lonely grieving Mr. Mason, reaches out to his late son bride, Daisy. He wants to establish some kind of relationship. Daisy, feeling that she married William under false pretenses, runs away. She's plagued with guilt. She's regret. She, she breaks into tears when she's on her own. Daisy, however, cannot avoid Mr. Mason forever and eventually accepts an invitation to tea at his humble dwelling. And here's how it goes. Daisy says, you shouldn't have gone to all this trouble. Not for me. I don't deserve it. Not when I was only married to William a few hours. To which Mr. Mason replies, you may not know this, Mason, uh, Miss Daisy, but William had three brothers and a sister, all dead at birth, or not long after. I think that's the reason why William married you, so that I wouldn't be alone. Without you, I've had no one to pray for. I think William knew that. So will you be my daughter? Let me take you into my heart, make you special. You'll have parents of your own, of course. Oh, I've gotten any parents, Daisy said. Not like that. I've never been special to anyone, except William. That's right. I was only ever special to William. Never thought of it like that before. Mr. Mason says, well, now you're special to me. Daisy has done everything she can to stiff arm Mr. Mason. She has clung with all her strength to our understanding of love as quid pro quo, this for that, that you can't receive love from someone who you don't love equally first. For Daisy, love is a matter of emotional righteousness, if you will of this feeling for that feeling. But this is a conception which causes her immense suffering. It blurs her vision. She's entirely caught up with her perception of the situation. When Daisy finally catches a glimpse of how she's perceived by William and by, consequently by his father, the scales fall from her eyes. What she thought was going on and what was actually going on are two different things. Mr. Mason is not relating to Daisy on the basis of, of her emotional righteousness, of her feelings of affection, but on the basis of her sons, his sons. And on that basis, he wants to adopt her. My friends, God does not relate to us on the basis of our emotional righteousness or any other kind of righteousness. No, he relates to us on the basis of his sons. And so we are sons and daughters of the living God. Let's pray. Um, Father, we are truly forgetful people. And we are amnesiacs to our own dismay. Um, to our own peril. Lord, pry our childish hands off um, the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world and cause us to run into your fatherly embrace, which has been approved for and won by our older brother, Jesus Christ. Thank you for putting us in union with him. Thank you for the spirit that you sent us. Might we listen to him today in Jesus' name, amen. Again, thank you.